Who's ready to get into God's Word today? If you have a Bible, I would like you to open it up to our core. You know, we've been in Hebrews, so we're going to continue on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Last week, we spoke about a man with a strange name. His name was Enoch. He is not related to a Star Wars hero, but he's a biblical hero, and uh, he was found in verse 5. Today, we're going to look at a man named Noah. How many of us, I I would be almost certain that if you've been in church for any amount of time, and even quite honestly, if you haven't grown up in church, this this man Noah and the ark, this is a pretty uh, well-known story about a man who not only like Enoch did he walk with God, but Noah worked a lot for God. And we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about a man named Noah. So Hebrews chapter 11 is where you're going to begin, and if you have a Bible, be ready to turn to Genesis chapter 6. That's going to be our core verse today where we're going to, we're going to jump in. So have Genesis chapter 6 and Hebrews 11 ready. We're going from New Testament all the way back to the book of Genesis and the Old Testament and, and let's get into it. Hebrews eleven seven 7 begins by saying this. Would you read along with me? By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by, finish that sentence, faith. All right, wake up a little bit, 11 a.m., that comes by faith. All right, let's, let's do it together. So much like this man Enoch, Noah, it says here he, he walked with God, but man, he was a, a worker. One thing I love about Noah is he heard God speak, he heard what God had told him to do, and then he moved. All too often, right, we live in a, in a time of history that's pretty amazing, right? Communication is amazing. The fact that we can get online, and I'm telling you this week, I could listen to Rick Warren, I could listen to Craig Grishel, I could listen to Francis Chan, I could listen to Tony Evans, whoever it might be, right? The fact that, like, technology allows us to tune in to some of the greatest communicators of the word there has ever been right? The fact that like with a click of a button, we can tune into sermons from anywhere in the country. We can tune into trainings or online teachings or online Bible studies, which are all so amazing. But all too often, we tune into something that has great quality, where God speaks, where God moves. He gives you a fresh word in a study. He gives you fresh word at a woman's conference or in a men's Bible study or at a convention or from a great preacher around the world. But all too often, We hear God speak, and yet if you're like me, sometimes we fail to move. We hear God's word, but we fail to activate. We fail to do something. And as Christians, as Christ followers, when we fail to move, when we fail to activate, I would say it like this, quite simply, our faith, when it is not active, it is dried out. It is dried up. It no doubt dries out. Uh, uh, my, my girls, um, they giggle at dad. How many, how many of you dads in the house? It's a good thing you're there because everybody just likes to laugh at dad sometimes, right? No, I'm teasing, right? We provide the comedic relief in the house, right? But sometimes my kiddos, they will laugh at me because, and I don't know if this is weird, raise your hand if you're with me. I really don't like the feel or the touch of lotion. You guys laugh, is it... Thank you. Anybody else? Just me and you, brother. All right, all right, my man, right? I don't like the way it feels. I don't like touching it. I don't like putting it. I mean, I'd rather my forearms just be flaky. I'm good with it, right? Just shed, put a little of that salt and pepper on there. It's all good, right? I I don't like the way lotion feels. It just grosses me out. I I don't like waiting for it to like dry when you put it on and then you have to wait for it to like soak in and all that stuff. I remember like we talk about a faith that's dried out. I remember my my 10-year-old, She was like one or two years old, and I remember we would have our bedtime routine with just one kid, because you know, routines are easy when you have one kid, right? Just boom, bada, boom, bada, bing, and I remember I would, I would, I would bathe her, and then I would hand her to mom, and mom would take care of, she'd dry her off, and before the diaper went on, before the pajamas went on, mom would just lather her up. She'd just get the lotion out, the baby lotion, and when Peyton was able to start talking, she would literally start scrambling. I was like, that's my girl, I love her right? She would start scrambling off the bed, and she'd go, stop lotion, lotion, stop lotion, lotion. She didn't know how to say no, or I don't like it, but she would say, stop lotion, lotion, and I just remember that because it would crack me up, 
But I, I felt the same way I could relate to her, where this, this lotion just feels, it just feels nasty. And I remember we were just recently in Florida, and who knew, like, that humidity and soft water? And, like, I remember we were in Florida on vacation just two weeks ago, and all of the ladies on the trip were like, oh, my gosh, my skin feels amazing right they're out of the vegas heat they're out of the vegas desert and everybody's like man this lotion all of it just feels so amazing they're amazed at how soft their skin felt but when we talk about this this kind of like idea of of being dried up a a non-active faith nothing activating our faith just as lotion is needed in the desert some of us love it right just as it's in the climate of Las Vegas, it activates, and when it activates, it, it, it soaks into our skin and keeps us from drying out, right? But truth be told, in the spiritual, many of us Christ followers, we, we, we tend to go through the motions at times, and we just kind of do the church thing, and we go through the actions or the motions, or we fake it really good, quite simply and quite honestly, because it's possible that our faith is dried up. Would you write this down, and, and, and this isn't in your notes, but I, I, I thought of this. Our faith always dries up when we fail to connect what we believe to what we do. Our faith always will dry up when we fail to connect what we believe, what we read, what God has spoken, what we believe to what we do. We had a theme at our kids' camp that we were teaching the kids, and one of the guest speakers, she said, if God said it, then it's true. Right, coming to that, 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 that knowing that in the Bible, if God said it, then it's true. James chapter 2, verse 14. Can we read this verse really quick before we get into Genesis? James says this, and he's the most honest. I love his, his, his writing style in Scripture. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and it is useless. We're going to look at the story of Noah and all throughout scripture. Would you agree with me when I say it seems like God requires action? When we talk about faith, oftentimes it seems like God, he desires movement. He desires your hands to be working. He desires your feet to be moving. It seems like when we move and when we act, that action becomes a motivator for God to do the miraculous. So oftentimes we want to wait around, well, God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? My prayers are just bouncing off the wall, but we're not moving and acting in faith. Faith isn't found in, in what we are feeling in the moment because the Bible says our feelings can deceive us, right? Faith is found in what we do. You know, it's, it, I, I, would, I would say it like this, you can actually feel. Has anybody here ever feel like you have no faith at all? Right? Can we be honest? Sometimes, have we ever felt like, man, God, I just, I've got questions, I, I feel like my, my faith is just, uh, 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 you know, not to go like Darth Vader, I found your lack of faith disturbing, right? But how many of us have ever felt that? Like sometimes we do, it's, and it's like we feel like we have a limited amount of faith or that we're running on empty. But you know, it's possible that when that actually happens, that you can actually still be full of faith when, when, when you act in obedience to what God says. Even when you are feeling like you are running on empty, when you act out in obedience, regardless of your feelings, according to the Bible, that is living out your faith. And the opposite is very true, where we can honestly, in similar fashion, run around shouting out our faith from the mountaintops. We can tell everybody, look at me, I'm full, I'm full. We can tell everybody I'm full of faith, we can post about it, whatever it might be, to everyone around you, but you don't actually have it because you don't actually do it. You see how that works. Number one, would you write this down? Sometimes moving in faith, it means not waiting for a group vote. We're going to look at the life of Noah in just a moment. Sometimes moving in faith, it means not waiting for a consensus. We like to gather and, and, and do our strategic, you know, let, let's gather up all the information. Let's get everyone's opinions. And here, here is what we will, I would just summarize Noah's life because a lot of us know this scripture before we get into Genesis chapter 6. What would have happened if Noah had waited for everyone else's opinion? 
What would have happened if Noah had waited for everyone else's approval? He would have waited for everyone else to make a decision, right? And if he would have waited for the opinions of everyone else, quite frankly, it's, it's like in culture, this, this term comes up a lot, and it's this cancel culture mentality, and it gets people fired up, right, one way or the other. But it can, it can have an effect on the decisions we make. Because we have a sense of fear of what we do or what we say, will it come back to haunt us or get us in trouble? And so we aren't actually able to make a decision because we're waiting for a consensus or we're waiting for everyone's approval. Quite frankly, if Noah had waited for everyone's approval, we would not be here today, right? Noah didn't fear culture. Noah didn't strive for the acceptance of his neighbors. He knew God. And perhaps, could we say it like this? Would you maybe write this down? Noah has become, or he became one of the greatest examples we have of faith and work put together. Did you catch that? He's one of the greatest examples in all of Scripture of faith at work. Faith at work, putting in the hard work when nobody is watching and no one's giving him credit, right? In a culture where no one else walked with God at all, Noah didn't cave to peer pressure. He didn't cave to what everyone said. A little bit of context. Would you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 6 and we're going to start off in verse 1. A little context for what is, is going on here. Culturally speaking, this is a time period where no one is walking with God. We're going to read about it a little bit in, in this passage, but no one cared to follow God, no one obeyed him. Let's read about it in verse 1. Do you have a Bible ready to go? Church, you have a Bible ready to go? All right, let's read it. Chapter 6, verse 1. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they're corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. They were powerful men of old and famous men. And let's look at verse 5. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of, human, of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Not sometimes, not I, I blew it, oops, it says all the time. Look at that in verse 5. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. The culture, the little context, this culture was totally wicked. The demise of every kind, human sacrifice, sin of every kind, debauchery of every time. Th things got so bad, it was just so evil. And how many of you know evil tends to breed more and more evil? Dirt tends to create more and more dirt. Filth tends to make things more filthy, right? It's like this filth is just piling up and and how many of you ever walked into your house with dirty shoes on, right? It's pretty easy to spread that mess if you have light carpets or whatever it is. Think of your trash cans. How many of us are very thankful? I'm so thankful for this certain company here in town called Republic Services, right? How many of us would say absolutely? Like if you had to choose one utility company, well, I'd be thankful for all of them. But like Republic Services, they come they collect the trash from the curb each week. We take it up, take it out to the curb. But think about this for a moment in your front yard, in your back yard, in your garage, wherever it is you store those big, bad, beautiful trash cans, one with the black lid, one with the blue lid, because we all recycle, right? Tease it, right, right, right? Yeah, of course, right? Well, think about this for just a moment. What were to happen if you just were to, you know what, for the next month, two months, three months, four months, you just decide to let the trash pile up. You just decide to let it stay there, especially in this wonderful Vegas 109 degree heat. It's not winter time where some of the, that, that, that scent kind of is hidden in the coolness, right? Right? In this 107 degree heat, it tends to get nasty. It tends to get filthy. And the worse it gets, the more and more filthy it gets, the more filth is almost drawn to it. You think about it with cockroaches and things and it just gets gross that like if we could describe Noah's culture it's just filthy and it's breeding more and more filth it's breeding more and more debauchery let's look at verse 6 and look at what the Lord says 
So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on earth. It broke his heart. Think of this, our Heavenly Father broke his heart and the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing. All the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds in the sky, I am sorry I ever made them. Can we look at that last verse? Look at that at the, at the very end there. He, he, God, stop for a moment and just let this, these words sink in for just a moment. God says, I am sorry I ever made them. They're wicked. They're overflowing with lies. They're overflowing with killing, with, with lewdness, with, with blasphemy, with war. They're overflowing with profanity. Nothing ever good comes to their mind. Nothing ever good comes out of their actions is what he's saying. The Bible says that God literally regretted his own creation because everything about mankind had become so evil. And almost as if, how many, how many kids blessed enough to be raised in a home with a healthy marriage and two parents, right, that are together doing it as, as a team? How many of you can remember looking back on your childhood and if you were a young man or a young woman, kind of when, when mom was home, did you, maybe messing around a little bit, and it's almost as if, think of, think of that moment when dad comes home. And he comes home and it's like, enough is enough. No more playing around, no more messing around. It's almost like God comes home, he's like, I've had enough of this evil, I've had enough of this wickedness, it's all going to stop, I'm going to end every bit of it. It stops here and now, is what God says. And, and remember, I mentioned the, the, the trash earlier, right? And we would all agree that, man, it's so important to get your, your trash out each week, especially in Vegas, and not letting it pile up. But I think one of the things that sets a lot of these summertime leaders that we're going to talk about, a lot of these heroes as we continue this series on Sold Out Summer, one of the things that sets them apart is, is I believe they model a consistency of repentance. They acknowledge when they mess up. We're going to look at the life of David. We're going to look at Abraham. If you've heard the story of, of Noah, do, we know right away he's far from perfect. Amen? All right? Anybody know? Right? It's Family Sunday. I'm not going to get into Noah's story. Right? We'll leave that alone. Right? But Noah is, is, is fully human, fully capable of mistakes, much like King David. But here's the thing I think about many of the biblical heroes. There's a point in time where they acknowledge their sin, where they acknowledge what's going on in their heart, where they acknowledge and they allow God to inspect them. I think that's something sometimes we get, we, we, we have fallen out of the habit of saying, you know what, God, I, I want to agree with you. I don't want to agree with what I feel. I want to agree with what you say in your word. To be aware of what you say and then to act on what you say, right? And on a regular basis, we think about like the spiritual trash that backs up in our home, in our hearts. So you look at, think of that visual of, of, of taking your trash to the curb, right? Every week, making sure we clean it up around here. What would our hearts look like? Number two, I, I think to be sold out, and we look at the heroes in Scripture, they, we can consistently activate faith's power. It means routinely addressing sin in our lives. Not just a, 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 a once a month, once a year type thing, but this seems to be a common theme for the heroes in Scripture is, is that they address what's going on in their heart. Let's continue in Scripture today. Verse 8. Let's read about this man, Noah. It says, Noah found favor with the Lord. Can you read that with me? Noah, Noah found favor with the Lord. And then it goes on in verse 9. Noah was a righteous man. What else do we know about him? It says, Noah was a blameless man. He was the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Our proximity to God has a big impact on what we experience with God. Our, our, our proximity to God, our closeness to God, uh, it has a, a large impact on God's favor in our lives, God's privilege over our lives, just like that song, God's blessing over our lives. And in Noah's case, not only did it spare his life, but I think like any good mother, father, grandfather, whatever your title is, you don't even need to be a parent, but to spare the life of your family. 
Not only did, did Noah, his obedience saved his life, but it saved the lives of those he loved most. Let's look at in verse 9. It says he was blameless. He was righteous. He walked close with God, and he wasn't a perfect person. How many of you are thankful we read about heroes in Scripture that aren't perfect? Do any of us have that perfect thing down? Not quite, right? We've all kind of blown it from time to time, but I think Noah, he, he, he was a man who knew how to take out some of the spiritual garbage. He was a man that didn't just ignore what was going on, and sometimes we can't ignore sin. Ignoring sin, think of your kitchen for just a moment. How many of us have, has anybody here love cooking? Love cooking for your family, whatever it is. I want you to think about this. For the next, just say the next month, everything you eat, everything you cook, after every meal, after every cup of coffee, every breakfast, how healthy is your breakfast? Do you do eggs and bacon or are you a yogurt type person? Or a no breakfast, you know, uh, what do they call it? The, the, the intermittent fasting type person. Think about everything you consume over the next month, whether it's Chick-fil-A or a homemade grilled chicken, whatever it is. And every time you eat or consume a meal, you decide to leave all of it on the counter. Think about this, you decide to leave all of it in the sink, every dish, all the bacon grease, everything, you just throw it in the sink, you let it pile up, all the old Chick-fil-A bags, if it's empty or not, you begin to just pile all of them on the counter. Could we say it like this, church, ignoring sin is basically letting all of the leftovers just pile up on your countertop. It's letting everything pile up in the sink. It's letting it pile up all over your life. Imagine what your house would look like if you did that for just a month. Heck, imagine what it would look like if you did it for just a week. Yet often for many of us, that's the very condition of what's going on in our soul, and yet we're coming to church, and, and we do the church thing, yet we leave our sin unaddressed, but we have this dirty environment going on inside of us. That's the picture, right? And as I said earlier, a, a dirty environment, what, it doesn't just magically create a clean environment. A dirty environment, it, it breeds more dirt, more filth. Number three. I'm talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, and as we come before the table of the Lord, how many of you just taken a, a quick break here? Did you grab a communion cup on the way in? It is Family Sunday. How many of us love taking communion? All right, eight, 12 of us. Come on, church. How many of us love taking communion? Jesus said, right, come to right, table of the Lord. It's important. Baptism is important. He didn't list a whole lot, right? But we're going to take communion at the end of service, and I always think, man, it's important to recognize the Holy Spirit's role in communion. His role to inspect what is going on, and that's on my heart today, as well as this, this heart of Noah preserving his family. Going along with even that song, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine upon you, may he give you peace, but may his blessing continue on for a thousand generations. And their family, and their children, right? Number three. When there's pressure going on, when we are pressured to conform to society, the Holy Spirit provides a counterbalance from outside pressure. The Holy Spirit's job is to fill us, is to protect us, to, to, to allow us to think differently. Noah faced some real opposition, didn't he, church, right? And, and don't, don't kid yourself, we face some real opposition today. People that don't, they do not want to see your marriage succeed. They don't want to see your, 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 your walks succeed. They don't want to see God's church grow, right? There's this real temptation for each of us to buy into what, what culture says. Young people in the house, right? You might feel it from friends, from family members, from people you work with, right? Even social media. I, I'm proud, some kids, like I am amazed by some young women today that take such a positive stand on what God's word has to say about life in the womb. Right? There's young people that I just, I, I marvel at their boldness, and I go, man, I wish I would have been more like them when I was 18. Right? It's, it's amazing. But even social media places a lot of pressure to conform to the things of the world. And pressure makes us uncomfortable. Pressure makes us, can I say that again? Uncomfortable. How many of us have ever had like an earache? How many of us, uh, does anybody here own a real pool? And by that, I want to say, like, qualify this, because it seems like the older I get, all these pools nowadays are like five feet deep. Does anybody here remember the good old days where we had pools that were like eight feet, ten feet deep, this thing called a diving board? No? A slide, right? Anybody here have a pool that's like eight, deep, eight feet deep or more? 
Look, nobody, right? Oh, okay, old, right? We're kicking it old school, right? But I remember like being a kid, when you swim down and you get to like seven, eight, nine feet deep, I remember this pressure that would build up in my ear and I would be like unable to relieve that pressure. Folks, think of uh, 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 an airplane, how they pressurize a cabin, right? They do that so we can travel safely. Think of a, a submarine, how they, they pressurize the submarine so it doesn't, the whole thing just doesn't get crushed. The Holy Spirit's role in our life is so we won't get swayed and we won't get taken over and we won't get crushed by the things of the world because without the Holy Spirit, we will change and agree with everyone else. Without the Holy Spirit, we will crumble, but with the Holy Spirit, we will hold fast when even the world is changing all around us. Let's look at more scripture. Hebrews 11, verse 7. I want, I want you to, to, talk about, to talk about this really quick. With the Holy Spirit, not only do we get protection, not only do we get relief from the pressure that the world places around us, but with the Holy Spirit, we get inside information. Right? I think of that like as, I wish I, I wish I had the ability as an investor to get inside information, right? We think about that all the time. But the Holy Spirit, look at this, what, what it says, by faith, look at Hebrews 11, verse 7. Noah, after he was what? He was warned about what was not yet seen, and he was motivated by godly fear. So he was, he was warned by God, and then it says he was motivated by godly fear he built an ark and he delivered his family the bible says that you know the holy spirit he, he will warn us ahead of time does that mean we are able to predict the future no 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 but we should be able to see spiritual truth when it comes to physical problems right life is is hard enough and and, and it's like god is saying noah warning there is a disaster up ahead with the holy I, I would hate going through life without the holy spirit just seeing how broken things are do you agree with me today like we look at the world and it, it is pretty sinful it's pretty messed up but with the holy spirit it allows us to see that for every physical problem the the root behind the physical problem we actually see it's a spiritual problem it's a problem in the spiritual realm that manifests itself into the physical. And Noah had this inside information. Genesis chapter 6, let's read it some more. Verse 13. Verse 13, will you read along with me? So God said this to Noah. Imagine talking with God about this, right? Noah, I've decided to destroy all living creatures. For they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out. I will wipe them all out along with the earth. And verse 14, build an ark, build a boat. You're like, what's a boat? Right, we think about it now, right? And I'm thinking like, build a, like a, a raft from Survivor. That ought to get it done. Right, now you're a boat, like I'm thinking, okay, six by ten, we're good to go. No, 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 he says, build a boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out, then construct the decks and the stalls and throughout the interior excuse me what right but I love this and, and we could have a whole teaching on the ark and the dimensions and all these different things but the reality is Noah heard God he, hear, he heard God's voice and then he moved he heard God's voice and then he moved right number four our final point before we come to the table of the Lord today we see this truth throughout Noah's story his testimony what god asks of us will often appear weird to the world think about that give away your time serve people feed people clothe people finance people right what god asks will often appear weird to the world and and that is so true for this man noah not only it wasn't just true for like a year or two years, or five years, for the next, get this, kids in the house, this is an old, old man. For the next 120 years, Noah would begin construction on this boat. 120 years. This would be a, a huge structure, and, and, and it's roughly, has anybody here been on a football field lately? Like, if you stepped onto a high school football field, I had the ability to go up to Palo Verde like three weeks ago or four weeks ago and check out this new turf that they put on the football field. And I played football for a few years. Pop Warner to high school, baseball, football. 
And I, I stood on that football field and I literally was like, I cannot believe how massive this is. I cannot believe, like, I got to run, like, the 100 yard dash is all the way down there. I couldn't, I, I didn't remember being on a field so huge. The Bible says that what Noah built over a 120 year period was a roughly one and a half football fields in length. One and a half. So it, it's not even like the football field plus the end zone plus more football field. And then it says not only was it one and a half football fields in length, it was four stories high. And to that world and to those neighbors and to that culture and whoever lived next to those cypress trees, that was like a football field and a half of a whole bunch of crazy. They're looking at Noah like you have lost your mind. As long as I've known him, he's just been cutting down cypress trees. Right? He gets his kids involved in it too. Dad, what are we doing today? Cutting down cypress trees. What do you think we're doing? Get out the saw, get out the hammer, get the tar, ready to go, right? But I think it's crazy, no matter what people think, no matter what God asks, it's, it's going to look weird, and even when it seems weird, even when it seems like we don't have the plans, even when it's not normal, we could go through an entire teaching on what Noah probably didn't understand, but it didn't stop him. Noah's, he was built like, how am I going to get the animals? I'm going to build it. How, like, okay, 120, can you imagine, like, I think of this, 120 years it takes you to build this thing. They call it a boat, but it's like a cruise ship on steroids, right? 120 years you spent your life building this. They don't know what rain is, and, like, he, he, he doesn't live near the ocean. 120 years, can you imagine actually completing the job, and then you're like, now what, Dad? Now what? No, like, we're done. We, we, we did it. He doesn't even know how the boat is going to get to water, but he keeps grinding, he keeps working, he keeps cutting, he keeps chopping, he keeps hammering, right? And this next verse pretty much sums up Noah, but it also sums up every hero in Scripture. Genesis 6, 22. So Noah did, here we go, look at this, exactly as God had commanded him. We see this about sold out heroes this summer when we talk about each person. Noah did it. God said it, so it's true. God said it, so I will do it, right? In church, that is in essence faith. When we talk about faith, that is it. God said it, so I will do it. We all have a testimony, a story, a sermon. There was something I caught this week about Noah. You know the Bible actually calls him a preacher? I never would have thought about that. When I thought about Noah, I'd have been like, he's a builder. He, he, he's a good dad. He, he preserved everybody. He took care of his family. But look what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 has to say about Noah. Let's look at this verse together. It says, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the floods on its ungodly people, but protected Noah. And then look at what it says. Noah was a preacher. He was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher of, of righteousness. And then it says, in seven others, right? He protected them. Noah and seven others, but it says Noah had a message. Noah had a sermon. Some of us think, man, I can't teach, I can't talk, I can't do this, I can't sing, I can't hang out with kids, whatever it might be, right? But here was Noah's sermon. You better repent, you better be ready because it's going to rain. Like, and he lived it, he lived it so well. It says Noah was a preacher of righteousness and God saved him. And then it says, don't miss this. And you don't need to be a parent. You don't need to be a grandparent. You could have little nieces and nephews, right? God has called you to care for kids, for families and that you are close to, that you are related to. It says those seven others. Did you catch that in Scripture? Those seven others, church, they happen to be Noah's family. They happen to be Noah's family. Danette, would you come and would you close us on keys tonight, today? It is daytime. Second service. But think about this, and, and if you are age 20 to 80 to 90, whatever generation you're a part of, isn't that the job that we actually have? It, like we can, we can make it sound difficult, we can dress it up, we can talk in Christianese in terms that people don't understand. But really, when it comes to leading people to Christ, when it comes to living for Christ, isn't the job that each generation have, it's to position our loved ones it's to position our family for spiritual victory really that's it Noah was told he was like he got this inside information from the Lord the world is going down things are going to end God is not pleased and Noah begins to build this vessel that kept his family safe 
that blessed his family in generations to come, right? And you think about that today, like when it comes to being a, a godly parent or a godly marriage, right? Godly people, godly heroes, heroes today, it's like, man, heroes, you don't leave your kids, you don't leave your home, you don't leave your marriage. It might be going through seasons where it feels broken, where it feels like you don't know what to do, right? But in Scripture, we see that the sold-out heroes we talk about, they look after the needs of their own. They position their family for a spiritual victory. Now, that doesn't mean your kids are going to make the perfect decision every time. Amen, parents, right? doesn't mean your, parent, your, your, your kids are just going to guarantee you, you did it good and your, parent, your, your, your kids will have their own decisions to make. But our job is to prepare them and to prep them for spiritual victory. Noah, there was so much he didn't know. We could, have, we could do a whole sermon on what he didn't know. But I want to sum it up like this before we come to the table of the Lord. Noah simply did what God said to do. He simply do, did what God said to do. And we do what God says. We position ourselves and we position those we love and we position those we care about. We position them for a better blessing tomorrow based on our obedience today. Someone say amen, right? And that is what we are called to do, to position those we love to experience more tomorrow, more of God tomorrow based on how we obey him in the present, right? And if I could leave us with one thing as Pastor Greg comes up, we're going to come to the table of the Lord. I would say it this, don't wait, church. When God speaks to you, move. When God speaks, do it. When his word tells you something, do it. And when you move, the Bible says he will show up. When you move, God will take over. When you move, he won't be late, but he will arrive right on time. When you move, he will send that rain when the project is complete and ready to go. When you move, God will be there. Amen? Amen. Well, let's bow our heads. And uh, where is Pastor Greg? Is he coming up here this morning? There he is. Would you come and would you lead us in, in communion today? And if you have your elements, church... I would like to invite you to prepare them, and if, if by chance you need um, communion, would you raise your hand as we are here? I see one in the front, one in the back, and uh, yeah, just raise your hand. Our ushers, our team, will make sure you have a cup. You are not uh, interrupting anyone. But here's what the Bible says when we come before the table of the Lord. One of my, my favorite things to do in church and as we even have our kids with us today. It's pretty cool, right? But the Bible says that we are to take inventory, that we are to ask the Holy Spirit to inspect us. We're to ask the Holy Spirit, God, and I, I just kind of in this, this message, there's a lot of different things, and maybe one of those points today is for you, and you can apply it. But I would ask you this. Would you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you an area of your life an area of your life where maybe it's taking out some spiritual trash. Maybe it's being a little bit more obedient. Maybe God has told you something and you need to do it. But I would pray that as we come before the table of the Lord, you would ask the Lord to reveal that to you today. Pastor Greg, would you take over here? How many of you enjoyed the uh, Word of God this morning? It, it's always interesting for me uh, to have two services. Um, I'm still trying to get used to the fact that I have my Bible, several chat or several different translations that are on my phone. But as I'm taking notes, one of the things that stood out to me was the illustration that Pastor Joseph used regarding garbage, regarding sin. And I don't know about you, but um, I should have cleaned out our garbage can last week. Um, it stinks bad and when it sits in the all the Las Vegas heat it just gets rancid and I, I then thought about what he talked about in regards to our sin piling up for a whole month in the kitchen and I realized that if we don't deal with this issue of forgiveness daily we, in fact, there's things in our life that begin to have a stench to them. My wife is a fanatic about our one countertop. It has to be clean. 
And you know, in order to gain favor with my wife, it has to be clean. I mean, husbands know what I'm talking about. You left your keys on the counter? I want you to know it's the same truth with the Lord. If we want his favor, we have to enter into his presence and cleanliness. And the only way we can do that is through the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made at Calvary. You know, extreme example of Joey's illustration would be the show in reality TV called Hoarders. Have you all seen that? It is disgusting. And what happens, for those of you who don't, don't watch those wonderful shows, um, you have a person who has difficulty, mentally, emotional issues or whatever. They can never throw anything away. And the house just fills up to a place where I've seen one episode they can't even get in the front door on the first floor. They have to go up to the ladder to the second floor because everything is piled up so high. And you see, when we have all that refuse of everything we've gone through, particularly when we get older, let's face it, you and I have some garbage there that we don't want people to see or to be aware of, or maybe it comes out with a little rancidness of uh, smell that it's not very attractive to the neighbors. But what happens is that garbage starts to go up. And now we're so overwhelmed. How am I going to fix this? Well, that's the point. You can't fix it. So what does the guy do? You have, you know, a brother or a sister who has a rescue or maybe the guy asks for help and income the cleaning crew and they you know take three or four days and they get everything out and they throw things away and it starts out with a clean house do you know that is exactly what the Holy Spirit does in communion we invite him to come in recognizing that we are sinners saved by grace and we ask him Lord I've sinned I need your help in cleaning this mess up. When I look at that understanding of the table of the Lord, and I, I look at the communion elements, I realize that he has given us a way to be reminded of what he did at Calvary. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And the reason he emphasizes the word broke. When you follow the Lord, you will be broken. Whether it's the cares of the world, whether it's people's expectations, whether it's disappointments. And you realize that that breaking was something that Jesus went through at Calvary for us. And so he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Let's do that together, shall we? There's one other thing that, that Joey uh, brought out this morning. And I want to use that before we take the blood. Um, I don't know if you heard it or not, but he talked about the motion. And he talked about his arms and he talked about the lotion that he put on his arms to make them clean. And, and all I thought about was you know, the motion of the lotion. And I realized that asking for forgiveness is that motion. It's not just applying the lotion, it's putting it in motion. And so today, would you join with me as we put into motion 
the way that Jesus told us that forgiveness takes place. The Bible says it this way. If you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, you shall have eternal life. That's how we put into motion the lotion. Jesus said he'd never partake of this particular meal until we're in heaven. But he gives us the privilege of sharing his blood representative of the great sacrifice he made at Calvary. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of your sins. Drink from it. Drink from the cup, all of you. Let's do that together, shall we? I'm absolutely amazed of the grace that God extended to Noah's family. I can't imagine how many people must have ridiculed him, have best gone by. In fact, it probably was a tourist attraction in their city. Hey, there's a crazy guy out there doing it for, you know, some estimates are 75 years, some are 120. Whatever it is, that's a long time. Yeah, there's the crazy guy. And yet, he held faith. He held fast. Would you bow your hearts and heads with me this morning? Father, thank you for someone like Noah. Lord, thank you that sometimes you call us to do things that go against the trend of the world. And rather than hide that or rather than do anything to not acknowledge it, Lord, we may we know deep down inside that you have called us to walk to the drumbeat of a different drummer. And so I pray for anyone that's here this morning, Lord, that as our heads are bowed, that maybe perhaps they've never made a decision to follow Christ Jesus. They've never surrendered their heart to him and, and basically just said it this way, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your whole household. And you'd like to know that saving grace this morning. I just want to give a moment as I scan the congregation that if you want to make a decision to follow Christ, would you just lift your hand very quickly as we look around the sanctuary this morning. Thank you. Anybody else at all? Father, we thank you for that hand that was raised. And we pray, Lord, that that would be the beginning of the journey of what it means to surrender a life to Jesus. To live our life in such a manner that we don't follow the, the influence or the way that the world does things. But we do things according to just like Noah did on the blueprint of that ark. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.